Hey everybody, welcome to today's webinar on vegetable gardens. I can't believe it is already September, but here we are. Um, I have just a few notes as usual before we get started. So for those of you, as always, who attend these classes, uh, just bear with me for a couple minutes if you are new and this is your first class, welcome. Uh, we're glad you can join us. So this is a Zoom webinar format. It's different than a Zoom meeting. We're not going to be able to see you or hear you during this talk. Uh, so if you have questions, you're going to hit the Q&A box on your Zoom menu, type those questions into the Q&A box, and when Peg is ready to start taking questions, we'll be, I'll be relaying those to her. If you have any questions during the call that are like technical or just anything for me that's not you know, who know, whatever it might be, if you didn't hear something or whatever, just also feel free to send those through Q&A or through chat and I'll respond. Um, I think that about covers all of our notes. We are recording today, so I'll be sending out the recording following the class. Um, so you can look for that as well as your class coupon tomorrow. Uh, and I think think that is about it. So uh, Peg is our instructor for today. Um, I know Peg really needs no introduction. She does a lot of classes with us. Uh, she works at our Fair Oaks store for the most part and has been teaching our classes for many years. She also uh, was a member of our gardening advisor team back when we had the gardening advisor TV show. Um, and I look forward to hearing her uh, experience on vegetable gardens because I know we can all learn a lot from Peg. Thank you, Peg. Oh, and thank you, and, and good afternoon, and welcome to this. Uh, probably a lot of you are seasoned gardeners, growing a lot of vegetables, and I'm very pleased that so many new people have come to this. And so if you are a seasoned gardener, try your best to encourage the young ones especially, but anybody near you that has not been gardening, because if you've got containers, you can grow vegetables and herbs. And, and I've been in this all my life, being a farmer's daughter and going through agriculture and all of that, and then into horticulture. And you know, I was thinking the other day, my very first memory, um, was probably three and a half, maybe. Now you're saying, mm, that's pretty young to be saying you had a memory. But I'm holding in my hand some of these ornamental peppers. And we have some absolutely beautiful ones out there that are just lovely in containers or, or in the ground for that matter. But my first memory in life was a little neighbor, young man, little boy, gave me a little cherry tomato, a little ornamental pepper, and told me how good it was. And I remember walking home with my mother crying every step of the way. That was a very bad thing to do. So people frequently ask us, are those little ornamental peppers edible? I have the vaguest idea because I'm not about to try one, okay? That, that memory and it never goes away, you know? So, Let's talk about vegetables and touch a little bit on herbs because you can hardly do vegetables without some herbs involved. And uh, Sally, if you bring up the uh, Sally, <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> Sally's on the other end. Okay, bring up the first picture. Um, we can't really talk about planting unless we talk about where we plant and, and how, what is our soil condition and what are the additives that you might use? What kind of fertilizers might you use? I have been gardening in this area, which is fenced with a deer fencing material because I can't spray those things with Bobex, which is the only way I have any other plants is to spray with Bobex. But you can't do that on your vegetables because if the deer don't want to eat it, neither do you. So. The soil in this area is quite good. However, we have so many different products and, and in some of these seminars coming up, we're gonna be talking about a number of these products because it's difficult to know sometimes which one should I use? Well, this is one that I've used fairly consistently. It's Coast of Maine product. It is organic 
and it is a blend of things that contains lobster and crab meal, which is incorporated into that. And I have found that it's a wonderfully nutritious thing to use. I use it in conjunction with plant tone, which is a product that I have used for years. It is all organic. It's very slow release. And, and I love using it because it feeds over a long period of time. And it is organic. Okay, so I put hands full of the coast of Maine when I'm planting just in one hole anyway. And I add a good handful of plantone and mix that thoroughly so that it's ready to go and ready to plant. Okay. Um, getting a little ahead of myself, I think, in the second, or is it the third? Let's bring up the next picture. Okay. I planted the, now I have tomatoes that are still doing well and squash and some of the other things that are in the area that I might normally plant my fall vegetables because. It's time to do that right now. Transplants, particularly if you like broccoli and, and the cabbages and that sort of thing. It, you can plant uh, some of the little transplants now, the lettuces and the other things, and you still have time to plant seeds even of kale and collards and turnips and that sort of thing. But I don't want to weed all year. So I actually am going to talk a little bit more about this. I, I think I got this picture a little out of line. I love to use, after I've planted these things, and believe it or not, that's lettuce, little plants, okay? It's in an area that gets some shade from the afternoon, but that's fine for lettuce and for the other things too until it gets established, until the tomatoes come out and then I can seed more into that area. So I find little patches and places within a large garden that has a lot of perennials in it that is an attractant for the birds, bees, and butterflies, therefore the pollinators, which is very good for the vegetables, okay? But I love to use the pine needles and, and I do that over um, sometimes newspaper. In this area, I didn't because I didn't have enough room to do that, okay? So I I did my plants, watered them in well, and then put down pine needles. In the next picture, this is a line where I have a bigger area and was able to actually do a row. And you can see that I pull those rows between some uh, mulch. And that mulch is the Virginia Fines, which I like very much, okay? Watered well, they've got their fertilizer, and then in the next picture you can see, and this is actually a picture from last year, you can see that they've grown along a little bit. I added the pine straw on top of that mulch, and then I was getting ready, I pulled a row, getting ready to plant onions. Now, onions are not in yet, but they should be in shortly, along with the garlic. And you really should get those into the ground just as soon as they come in, because it's wonderful to pull those, especially the fresh green ones. I love those. And this is the best time of the year to plant garlic, okay? So let's, let's go into the next one. Again, this was from last year. It is time for you to put in those things that have heads, to put in the broccoli, do the transplants on that, to do the cabbage. If you do Brussels sprouts, those are the things to use. And you can see just beside that, there's some shorter things growing, which is lettuce, because the lettuce you can harvest over a period of time and then it's gone and the other things continue to grow. Now, a little bit better explanation in the next picture is how I actually try to keep down the weeds because I do not, I don't mind some weeding, but I don't like extensive weeding. Plus the weeds rob the soil of the nutrients that your vegetables need, okay? So where I have the space within the vegetable garden or anywhere else, but not over where you planted bulbs, okay? So if you've got bulbs in the ground, you can't do that with the newspapers. I put several thicknesses of the newspapers. I put 
the Virginia Fines mulch on top, and I frequently top it off with the pine needles. I like the look of it, plus the slugs don't really like those pine needles, and so I, I have fewer of those. Now, I do have to say that all of these vegetables are planted within an area, as I mentioned earlier, that have a, a lot of pollinating plants that the pollinators come to. I really have very few problems with insects and, and uh, because there are lots and lots of birds too, but I have lots and lots of good, good little guys. And while I don't like the mosquitoes, I don't spray with the, the uh, chemicals because that kills all the good guys. And uh, so I have to deal with the mosquitoes differently, okay? So that's how I try to keep down the weeds. Not in every area do I have space to do the newspaper thing then I'll just do the mulch and top it with the pine needles. Now, I do grow a lot of things in containers. And this was last spring actually, but now is the time to do some transplants with um, your spinach. I enjoyed this so much. It was nice thick leaves. And here again, I used a good potting soil. Our Merrifield potting soil is good. I particularly, like the, um, let's come back to me for a minute, Kelly. Let me show you. This is the bag from the coast of Maine. As I said, it does contain, it's, it's all natural and it contains the lobster and crab meal in it. That is fantastic. Now you don't want to use a lot of that in containers, but you can use several handfuls mixed into a good potting soil. And what is a good potting soil? Our Merrifield blend is excellent. This Aspoma is an organic one and it has is really good also. It has earthworm castings, feather meal, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, has a lot of good things in it. And so I, I have used this extensively and it's perfect. I have to say, my they're all very good and it's really hard to choose one among them. But if I had to top the list, it would have to be Fox Farm. Now it is the most expensive one, but I love it. I really do. It has a lot of good things in it. It also has earthworm castings plus a lot of nutrients. So let's say that those are, are three of my picks, Mary Peels, the Espoma, and, and the Fox Farm in containers. And anybody can grow these things in containers. Don't choose a small container, get a bigger container, okay? Because when it's hot in the summertime and it can go into the 90s, it dries out too quickly if it's just a little container. And even on a deck or a balcony, it's delightful to have these containers with some vegetables in it. And you can rotate them and keep them going because in the next one is lettuce. And, and that's a great one too. It grows quickly. You can harvest the leaves, hopefully from the bottom is good, and it will continue to grow and you can harvest it for quite some time. Now you can extend this by planting some in containers with the, the little plants and then seeding some in and they come quickly. You just have to watch your moisture, not let it grow, uh, dry out. Otherwise the seeds don't work very well. And it's time to put them in the ground if you're, if you're doing it that way. So um, it's fantastic. Now, as I said in the next one, you can see, again, this was from last spring. Um, but it, the fall is actually the best time to grow really great broccoli, really great cabbage. Um, incredible. And it's so nice to, um, to be able to go out and harvest your own and know that it's not laden with um, chemicals. Right. Okay. Let's come back to me for a minute, Kelly. I do need to talk to you a little bit. I told you I don't, I avoid the use of chemicals wherever possible. 
there is a spray of this too, but I think I only brought the powder up. I'm not talking about killing the caterpillars of uh, the beautiful butterflies and so forth, because they are very specific as to which plants they go to, okay? But when it comes to broccoli and cabbage and all of your green leafy vegetables, the cabbage butterfly will lay their eggs on there and then they can devour them almost overnight, okay? So I use ther uh, BT, it's called Bacillus thuringiensis. Dipel is the common name. This comes as a powder that you just dust it with and it's very, very easy, but there's also a little bottle that you can spray with. And they come so quickly, they can almost take you by surprise. I really have back in the back, a container that has many different types of lettuce in it. But if I turned it around, um, Leo has planted a couple of, uh, I believe it's broccoli in the back. And when our back was turned, I actually, Thought I had a little caterpillar on here, but I'm not sure where he, oh, yeah, he did. And I don't, since I can't zoom in, you probably can't see it. But that's the kind of damage, and there's a little caterpillar right there. That's the kind of damage that you can get. And that happens when it's warm, but it's only the cabbage, and it's the little whitish yellow butterfly. It's only those that go to these plants. And so when you use this natural product, it's not a chemical, okay? When you use this BT you asked for in a dust or in a liquid form, this is that when it gets cold, you don't have to worry about it. But right now you do. And you really will need to use one of those, okay? Now you can also, um, if you choose to, and I, to me it's more difficult, you can also use a product called Harvest Guard. This is a very, very thin product that you can actually peg down loosely because you need to give the plants room to grow. You can loosely peg this down with what I call big old hairpins, okay? They're sod pins and we do sell these and they're very easy to use. And you can pin it down with that carefully so that the butterflies can't get underneath and, and lay on them. And actually, I think there's a net picture in the next one that shows this. You can see how thin that fabric is and it's reusable. I absolutely keep a lot of this on hand. In fact, my son gave me a large roll of this for Christmas one year and I'm still using it, okay? But when you want to cover to keep the, as I said, the cabbage butterfly particularly. You can do this, but cover it loosely because you can leave it on. You don't have to take it off. The sunlight goes through it and the water goes through it. So you don't have to worry about it, but you want to pin it firmly enough that those little uh, buggers can't get underneath. Okay, now this thing serves a dual purpose. If you invest in this, you can use it for this purpose. But the biggest purpose is, as we go into the fall, these things tolerate and love the cold weather. They love the frost. But when we go along and it gets really cold, it, you, you want to protect them sometimes. And you can take cabbage and you can take broccoli and take all of these things deep into early winter if you cover them with the frost cloth and you can leave it on. You don't have to worry about taking it off. You can actually use this product also if you've got beautiful containers in your garden right now and they're thriving and mine are and I'm right, not ready to take those out and we're going to talk about that next Thursday with the um, the fall containers because I've got lantana that is just gorgeous, plus a lot of other things that birds, bees, and butterflies, particularly the hummingbird, 
is really enjoying. When you have, you can, as long as they're beautiful, you can cover these if frost is predicted with this. So that is an invaluable property. Okay, let's go to the next one. There's many different ways of preparing the soil. This is a raised bed. <coughs> and it's got little rows pulled in it. And to that, again, additives, fertilizer. And there are a lot of different fertilizers. I go to that one because it's organic and it's slow release. But there are a lot of other fertilizers too, if you don't mind using a, a chemical-based fertilizer. And certainly in my life, I've used plenty of those. And certainly in the farming situation, we had to use them because it wasn't practical to do it any other way. So it had to be done that way. So I'm not anti-chemical at all. I'm not, I just judicious use of it, okay? So raised beds are wonderful, but you can also incorporate these things within existing beds. If you've got a perennial garden or you've got a small townhouse backyard and you've got an area where you can plant a tomato or, or a squash or, or those things, then you can follow it up with some of these fall vegetables. So there are lots of things. Now, I, when it comes to planting, I like to have on hand a lot of this next product. This is parsley. I love to use parsley in my cooking. And so I plant a lot of it, but I plant some knowing that particularly the swallowtail uh, butterfly will lay their cats on the parsley and they will eat a good bit of parsley. But I love those butterflies. And so I want to protect the them. The only one I'm trying to get rid of is that little cabbage butterfly, okay. And that doesn't affect these because they don't eat that product. They are very specific as to what they want to eat. And parsley is one of those things. So include uh, what you know you're going to cook with and a little extra, okay. I highly recommend that. Okay, in addition to all of the vegetables, there's also the fruits that you need to think about. And figs. Um, this one has produced this year a lot of figs. Uh, one of my daughters has a brown turkey fig. And it is actually gets full morning sun. Not a lot of hot afternoon sun, but it, it takes hot afternoon sun, okay but it's thriving with full morning sun protected up against the foundation of her house and they have harvested so many figs. Now, sometimes you have to protect the lump. Um, I do have some sort of little varmint. I think it's either a squirrel or a chipmunk or both that, that like to harvest them also just about the time I want to harvest them. So I've got to take myself out there and and uh, wrap some um, deer fencing, the, the narrower, tinier one around these so that hopefully I'll get some of those figs this year because they got most of them last year. Very aggravating. Okay, the next picture. I tried some shallots um, last year for the first time and my goodness, did I enjoy those. I grew them in containers. I didn't have a lot of them. But, but they were very enjoyable. So think of a spot where you can perhaps try a few of those and, and onions too, uh, to include in that. I did take the next picture at a customer's home because I was very impressed with where they put herbs. They had this lovely planter built into their deck and their sage, their chives, there's a couple of different kinds of sage. I think there's thyme. I'm trying to see what's in there. Probably dill. They may even have had some peppers, but it was beautifully, beautifully done. 
And in the next picture, this was uh, a couple of years ago, actually, we were able to tour the, the White House and gardens uh, in the fall. And uh, we got to see the presidential garden. And what you're seeing in the front is Swiss chard. And that's wonderful in, the, in uh, salads. It's very tasty the stems as well as the greens. And you can see that they have onions growing in the background, an awful lot of things. I think this was the end of the tomato season and the start of the fall season. So that that was neat and a wonderful opportunity. Let's let's come back to me I and mean, let's talk about a few of these things. I told you about the dipel, okay? That's for the vegetables. I have to keep on hand the deer repellent and I primarily use the Bobex, but there are others too that can be used. I use this pretty consistently and you do have to reapply it there. It doesn't get washed off by a normal rain but you do have to reapply on new growth and you do not use this on your vegetables. Cannot do that, okay? Now, let's talk about, you can still do, um, as I said, the parsley. It will go, it's a biennial, so you'll enjoy it now. You'll enjoy it some in the spring and then it will run up and, and do its seeding and it's done after that. So you have to continuously plant this. And it doesn't come as quickly as lettuce does. It takes a little longer for parsley to germinate. This is the curly leaf, and this one is the Italian parsley. And I try to do both, and I enjoy cooking with both of them, or even finely chopped up in salads is excellent. And I always have to have basil on hand. And you can enjoy this outside until it gets really cool. And you can actually bring it into a sunny window inside and continue to use that. So one has a, so, so fragrant. I love all the fragrances of this, okay. Now, I've noticed, oh, and I can't be without sage. Now, here again, not small containers. They need to be larger. This is an absolutely beautiful rosemary. Rosemary, particularly the hardiest one, and art so far for me has been Hardy Hill art primarily, the hardiest of the rosemary. This pot is too small to overwinter it in. They demand very good drainage, number one. And it needs, every now and then, if we have a really severe winter, you can lose it, okay. But I have had mine and kept it going for quite a while now. We haven't had really, really bad winters. And if you're growing it in a container, especially if it's on a balcony or a deck, you can cover it. You can use that frost cloth and you can double it up somewhat. If it gets really cold, and we will be talking more about containers later and talking about how you can further insulate that pot. You can put a piece of um, a bubble wrap around it and then cover that with maybe some pretty burlap and tie it on. That will help, but pick a, small, a bigger pot because particularly going into the winter, it, it freezes. It's going to get colder than the air around it. So therefore, the bigger pot is really important. Okay. Uh, did you say that rosemary was hill hardy rosemary? No, this one is ARP. A-R-P. Another one that's pretty hardy is, is hill hardy, okay? But most of the time we carry ARP and it has, for me, been very hardy. Okay. Now I have I don't have any notes to send to you. So there's not quite as many 
not such variety in this family that it should be too much of a problem. Okay, let's talk about lavender. I have to have lavender. I absolutely love it. Some people cook with it, some people make tea with it. Um, I love the blossoms, I love to dry them, bring them inside. And there's some new varieties out there now. Uh, last The last couple of years, one that was prominent was phenomenal. It was very blue-gray foliage and had lovely blossoms in it. And when I was looking through things today, I discovered two other varieties that I have not planted. This one is called Silver Mist. And it should be hardy. I haven't grown it yet. But I love the color of the foliage. And I love the length of the blossoms. Now, I have a row of lavender that I have maintained now for several years. It has some special requirements. The first is drainage. It does not tolerate wet soil and particularly in the winter time. A lot of times people are in their homes and they don't think about the soil moisture in the winter time. But there are some areas of my garden that can stay pretty moist. It's really kind of strange because I've got some areas that stay wet. I know there's something going on underground because I've lost some trees. Uh, and then I have other areas that are just bone dry. And I got rain last night and I was so excited. I think I got at least an inch of rain and I hadn't had that kind of rain in a month. Okay. So my plants are most appreciative. But getting back to the lavender, excellent drainage. This one is actually planted at the top of a bank. It drains pretty well, but it was heavy duty clay. And so I worked into that sand. Now you have to be careful how you use sand because they've always said a small amount of sand and clay makes concrete. Well, anyway, I used a fair amount of sand, working it into red clay. And then I also used small pebbles. I really uh, love to use those to loosen up the soil. And so I know that I have really good drainage. And there's a row, a couple of rows of these planted there and a number of different varieties because I love to try all these varieties to know what they're going to do. So they bloom heavily in the spring. And when they do, when it's all finished, when I either want to harvest them fresh so that the blooms are, are great, I once used a lot of this in one of my granddaughter's weddings. I cut it where it comes all the way back and I know that there's fresh foliage here. So when I'm finished, when it's all done, I will come in and go and take away all the old blooms. You never cut back into really old wood. There is no old wood on this plant. But as they age, they can develop some old wood and you never cut into that. You only cut where there's foliage growing. But let's say this is the spring and this is finished. You can whack this back and it will throw out new growth, which will also set buds. And then it will bloom beginning in late August and September again. So you'll have another flush of uh, blooms. When those are finished up, I will go out and again cut it away. And that, it, it'll stay that way. It may not get much new growth, but as soon as spring opens up, it'll send up that new growth and that next flush of bloom. So that's how I deal with my lavender. This one, as I said, is called Silver Mist. And this one that I'm not familiar with, it, they're all Angustifolia lavender, okay? This one is called Imperial Gem. 
Now, notice the change in growth habit. This one has tall, spiky flowers, whereas this one has shorter spikes on it. And here again, you just simply, this, this is because you could meticulously come in and cut, but I don't, I don't have that kind of time. I just, with my little uh, clippers, go choop, and, and fine, take that away, and it comes out and, and keeps the bush nice and attractive, but it also sends up a lot of new growth. Now, I'd like to trial these plants because I don't know them. I haven't grown them. But most of the others out there, I have grown. Hidco, Munstead, they're the shorter varieties that bloom this way. And the other ones are taller varieties, but you can, you can look at them and tell what their growth habit is right now. Love lavender, can't be without it. Needs sunshine, needs drainage. Doesn't have to have full day sun. What I have growing actually is um, probably no more than seven or eight hours of sun during the day. But for them, that's full sun and that's good enough. Okay. All right. I'm going to share with you now some fun things. There has to be fun things going on in the garden. And I ask you, even if you're not an experienced gardener, to share with others, your next door neighbor, your child, your grandchild, because they're our next generation. Now, I did it with my children. I did it with my grandchildren. And now God has blessed me. I'm doing it with two little granddaughters. And so Clara is out harvesting the lettuce. And then she probably will eat it on the spot. Now I did something else in the next picture. It has to be fun, especially if you're two years old and three and a half. Clara, who has been, I think, in every one of my zoom classes because she is so involved with the garden not just in mine but in her mother's and in her aunt's aunt bridget's so she's well exposed to all of this but you have to be sure that it's fun for the little ones for the young ones particularly i think it needs to be fun for all of us for that matter so I created, I did this primarily for my grandchildren, and now I'm doing it for these children. I created a fairy garden. And these are little make-believe flowers. I made it a fun place, and I have all the little furniture that I'd saved through the years, even for the grandchildren. So what Clara is doing here is actually using some artificial flowers, little odds and ends that I have a lot of. And in the small pots, I taught her to put a little piece of oasis in it so that it would hold them in. And she's creating containers in those little pots for her fairy garden. So she's having fun. And she's being joined in the next picture by her little sister, Lydia. Lydia is two. And I made little sandboxes for them, which I cover when they're finished to be sure no kitty cat comes, okay? Um, and then with these little, little flowers, showed her how she could make little rows with her silk flowers and just push them into the sand and create her own little garden. So they've got fun place to play, okay? Now, I had a wonderful experience yesterday. My neighbors who retired recently and had never done vegetable garden made last year one raised bed on the side of their house, not in their front yard where it might be obnoxious, okay? If, especially if they let it go and had all kinds of tomato cages in it, you know? Uh, yes, I know it's being done, but is, you know, you 
you want your front yard to be attractive to. You have to do it in a fashion where it's attractive, okay? So this is a side garden. It gets full afternoon sun, gets some reflection off the brick walls. So it's really a perfect kind of thing. I was kind of pleased um, as they made their progress and they said, you've inspired us to, to do this. They had such good luck with tomatoes and just a few things in that first raised bed that they added five more down the line so that that entire side of their foundation is all boxes that they're growing vegetables in. And so she asked me to come over and pick those vegetables while they were away for a couple of days. And I did, and I was thrilled because I had not seen exactly what they'd done lately. And so I discovered that growing up, that fence that he installed, and I want to tell you how he did it, there was a squash that I'm not familiar with. There were cucumbers, there were vining beans, vining peas, and at the base of them, wonderful tomatoes, cherry tomatoes primarily, all thriving. So the little girls were at my house yesterday and, and they toured my own garden. They played in their little fairy garden. And then I said, Clara, come with me to pick some vegetables, okay? My neighbor has said that I should come over and harvest some of the vegetables. And so Clara went with me into this garden. And I should have actually put more of the pictures in because I was so excited. She is with her Aunt Bridget and has begun to pick actually the beans. Now you can carefully see a black post to what I'm looking at, her left, my left. That's a tall metal post that has little hooks on it. And so as his vegetable grew, he became concerned about what they were gonna grow on because he had never done this before. So I helped him with a couple of things. And then he, took off on his own and decided this is what I'm going to try. And so he put those metal posts in along that entire foundation. This is a good five feet out from the foundation. He mounted a four foot metal fence on the top part of it. And those vegetables began to grow successfully up that fence. We're talking cucumbers, we're talking squash, we're talking beans and peas. And they grew so well that he installed more of those metal pipes near the foundation. And he added that four foot fencing to the top. Okay, and it was so exciting. And you know, Kelly, I don't think that I put in one of the pictures of her inside the tunnel. I'm so sorry that I didn't. But if you see where she's standing right here, she just walked underneath. Now, there are no plants against the foundation wall because they would not have gotten enough sunshine. But this created a complete canopy. And I really thought I had included a couple of the pictures of her standing in there. And I could even go in there myself. And she was so fascinated with the vegetables that were hanging down in, inside. And she could walk the entire length of that and pick vegetables. And she just came out with hands full and smiling. And I was, I, I thought about Monet. You know, I thought, oh, this is the vegetable garden. But, you know, I know that they're in all these display gardens and the wealthy gardens and so forth. All of this is done plus. But we're talking about somebody who had never done this before. 
and I think did a marvelous job. And you don't have to have everything perfect, you know. Uh, it's just you get out there and do it. But she had a blast under there. Now they have down from this a couple um, of those areas where some of their vegetables are finishing up. Maybe there's a couple of tomatoes. They grew some okra. Uh, some of them are finishing up. That's the ideal place to seed in some of these leafy vegetables. And I'd like to encourage you to do that because it's a wonderful wonderful thing to do now i do want to mention oh by the way i brought this up here because my knees can't stand to be on the hard ground and i this is my favorite one it is so squishy it's wonderful so this is what i use for my knees to get down and down and dirty yes clean dirty okay I want to tell you, because those of you who have deer, okay, the Bobex helps with the eating. But Bobex does not do a thing for rubbing. And we are rapidly approaching that time. It's almost here. It's September, October, November. You have uh, the rubbing of the antlers. And it can destroy a lot of things. I have had them destroy some things. And they always know the most expensive things. And they go for those first, okay? Whether it's Japanese maple or what it is. So I actually, one of my first choice is the two-piece tomato cage that Bob Warhurst brought to us years ago. And I use it for my tomatoes. And then I take it off the tomatoes and I put it around some of the prime trees. I can't protect everything, but I try to protect the most important. Okay. So that's one way. Another way is to buy the deer fencing and use some posts. I find it very easy to use. If I come up five feet, that's usually enough. I use the metal posts in it and then put the deer fencing around it. And that keeps them from rubbing. And that's fairly inexpensive. Uh, rebar is perfect to do it with, as long as it comes up five feet. Usually will deter them, especially if it's out front. It's particularly good with bushes, okay? I have a lot of attractive plants that are not trees, but they'll tear them up. Now we do sell, this is a wrap thing that, that you can wind around the, a tree, a single trunk tree. Um, my problem is it's white, you know. Uh, I don't really use that because most of mine are bushy and I need the fencing to do that with. So I needed to mention that to you because it, it's time and it's very disappointing to go out into the garden and discover that they have destroyed some of your favorite things. And when they rub all the outside bark, they can no longer get the nutrients up and that's it, you know? So I think we'll have time for a few questions. All right, thanks, Peg. Um, we will start at the beginning. Let me just scroll up here. Um, if anybody has questions, please feel free to send them in. If we do not get to your question today, you can hit reply on that confirmation email. That goes directly to me, um, and I'll share any questions you guys have with Peg. So just a note, if you guys have a question, you think of it later or we don't get to it today, we can follow up with you after the class. Um, okay, the first question. Um, if you're planting garlic in the fall, is it usable next year or does it take longer? Like when would you start harvesting that garlic? You should be able to harvest some next year. What that garlic will do, particularly, it's, it's really best if you plant it in the fall. It can be planted in the spring. But what that garlic will do is come up and throw up its leaves in the wintertime. 
And actually, not all of them, because those leaves are producing the, the bulbs too. But you can actually use some of those leaves to particularly rub in a salad bowl. And that gives it a, just a nice garlicky flavor. So I've used it in that fashion. What it does is it comes up in late winter and it will produce its foliage. That foliage will continue to grow going into the summer and then it will turn brown. And when it turns totally brown, you can dig that up. You can use part of it and you can put part of it back into the soil to keep that garlic growing. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay, next question. And I know we're actually going to be doing a class, I think, that might involve this in a few weeks. But um, do you ever add earthworm castings to your mixes when you're planting vegetables? I've heard that it's good. Earthworm castings are very good. Yes, very effective. And some of these things have earthworm castings in them, okay? And particularly, I was reading through, um, yeah, both of them do, this Fox Farm earthworm castings, and the other one has it too. Yes, I highly recommend that. Okay, great. Next question. Can you grow Brussels sprouts in containers? Uh, yes, David Yost did a couple of years ago, and I was amazed, oh, yeah, yeah. He did. amazed at the success that he had. What's the smallest? Done that, but he did it, and I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the smallest container you would recommend for that? Uh, nothing, nothing smaller than 14 inches. Okay. That would be the minimum. Okay. Um, okay, next question, and I actually have used, I don't, I'm, I'm curious about this. Is there a difference between potting soil and potting mix when growing vegetables in containers, or are they just kind of different ways of saying the same thing? Well, I have to be careful how I answer that. Yeah. Um, potting soil uh, is what we think of when we're doing containers, but it could also be called a potting mix. Potting yeah. Kind of potting, potting as opposed to planting mix. Yes. And there's where people may be a little confused. We sell a couple of planting mixes, which are recommended to add to the soil to loosen up heavy clay. Planting mix. When it's called potting mix, then that's fine. Okay. But, but don't assume that every potting soil is equal. It's not necessarily the case. As I said, we carry, and I only mentioned three varieties here, and we carry some very good ones, but it is possible to find a much cheaper brand that is a cheaper brand, okay? Okay, next question. Do you buy a new rosemary every year or can we use the same plant for a number of years? Does it lose any flavor? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, no, if you succeed in getting it through the winter, enjoy it. I might, similarly to, well, it's back here and it's heavy, but hopefully you've harvested it through the season. This one has not been harvested from, it's for sale here, but I think in the spring, it's awfully nice early to, to trim it back some so that we'll bush out and therefore you'll have more. But no, keep it going. Okay. Absolutely. I love rosemary. All right, next question. How do you deal with white flies on kale? White flies on kale. You know, um, are they white flies? Are they the um, the little butterflies flying around? That dipel is the only thing I would put on it, you know? Um, you'd have to ask that question of David Yost because yep. I haven't had white flies on it. And okay. I, I don't want to put chemicals on my vegetables, okay? All right. I'm going to say, send me an email about that. If you yes, don't have let's, to let's ask to David. David what is the least? I, I know years ago, were they seven was used. And I, I really don't know because I don't use chemicals on my vegetables. I All don't. Right. All right. Um, next question. 
let's see. Oh, we just had, okay, let's see. Um, are for a 14 inch pot, what depth do you require? Could I put some styrofoam? Oh, I know you have some good tips on dealing with heavy containers. Um, can I put some styrofoam in there to make the big container lighter? Under no circumstances. No styrofoam. <laughs> No, I know you they, have need, they need that soil yeah. to do their thing, okay? Yeah. No, please don't do that. I know sometimes people who have really, really tall and big things will put some things in the bottom and it must succeed for them because they seem to continue to do it. Not recommended. Though. Oh, they're heavy, but I have a little, I call it a truck. Yeah, you have your little dolly, right? Yeah, my little dolly that I move things around with, you know. Plus, there's an, another thing, too, that I didn't mention as far as containers. And every time I talk about containers, I need to talk about that. If, I, if you have a saucer under it, which I do with some things right now, because when it's 90 degrees, it's hard to keep things watered, even big pots. I'll have a saucer under it. That saucer will come out from under that pot before it freezes mm -hmm. because you do not ever want a container to sit in water it will break so you need to use your saucers to help you keep things watered in the summer but absolutely take it out before it freezes okay the other thing is don't ever leave a container sitting on the ground in the winter time because it'll absorb that moisture and is likely to pop okay it's fine if it's on pot feet or i really love to have we sell them in the greenhouse they're not cheap but they last forever they are containers that have wheels on them that you can move around that way okay i know these containers are heavy i pretty much determine where i want them to be and that's where they stay unless i use my little thing to move them around with okay yeah i know they get pretty heavy um okay let's see oh here's a someone said okay here we have a comment that's another good one i plant my large plants in a plastic pot then put them inside the ceramic pot so that they can have just move the plastic pot if they need to it's a good idea lots of creative solutions um okay. and there are a lot of people that do that <laughs> depends upon how big that plastic pot is yeah still the soil's heavy yeah if you've got a pot that's this big it's still no big. it just needs that soil to do well yeah yeah um all righty next question how do you how do you protect figs from birds and squirrels do you wrap something around i didn't understand that portion do you wrap something around the branches with the figs do you wrap the deer fencing around the whole tree and the birds steal or fix? Well, I would try to wrap around the entire thing. Okay. It's the problem, th this is about the only way, unless you make a cage over it. Uh, the, the only problem with that is it'll get stuck on the branches and you have, when you start to remove it, then you've got a little project ahead of you. But, you know, you want to save those figs, so I... I haven't done that yet because they're not ripe yet. But if I don't do it soon, I will not get any figs. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to protect those from yes, critters. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. The first is, are you able to grow all through the winter with a cover? I guess like a harvest guard cloth. Well, the, certainly the harvest guard cloth, this one that I showed you, the white one, is fantastic and it will take it through quite a bit you know now whether or not you're able to grow through the whole winter is going to depend upon the severity of the winter okay if it snows snow is actually keeps the ground warmer but if it's heavy enough it's also going to to break the things down you know so there are a lot of people, some people have greenhouses. I don't happen to have one. Um, <laughs> I asked my sons to build one years ago and they said, no, nope, not going to do it. I said, what? They said, mother, at least you're in the house and you're not in the garden in the winter time. So they wouldn't do it. Okay. The other one is a tunnel. 
Okay, and that's really not difficult to do. Uh, you you can simplistically use some rebar and some PVC pipe and then cover it with some plastic, but it has problems. You know, how are you going to water it? So I haven't done that. I use this when it gets really too cold, give it up, you know. Got it. Okay. It depends on how, sounds like it depends on how much investment and how much time and work you have to kind of make things, make things work. You have to justify it. I, we women are good at justifying things. <laughs> All right. This is our last question. Um, how do you plant garlic cloves? Do you remove the skin from the top to help it sprout? I tried burying the clove, but nothing came up. Oh, dear. Uh, I usually, and you're told to do this, you carefully remove the skin and pull the little garlic pieces apart. And don't plant them too deeply. That's part of it. Plus winter drainage. Don't plant them in an area that stays wet. Particularly if it stays wet in the wintertime. They won't make it. They'll run. I'm sorry. I forgot my last question that came in. Um, okay. This is about the parsley. Okay. Um, this person's parsley is spotted, like some of the parsley in your photo. And they were wondering if it was some kind of damage or if that was like from the caterpillars or if that was sun or heat damage. In your photo, it looked like it was kind of whitish in some areas. Okay. Okay. I thought it might be the type of parsley. Now, sometimes that's the heat of the summer that okay. goes black because it's not a it's not a disease, you know. It's probably the end of the summer. Just and from maybe the it's kind of finishing up, you know. Got it. Okay. It's not normal. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so that answers that. All right. That is all the questions for us today. Peg, thank you so much for coming on to talk about vegetable gardens. Thanks everybody who's sending messages. We appreciate it. Um, we will follow up uh, tomorrow once we get the recording ready with your coupon with the class recording. Peg will be back on Thursday with part one of her fall container gardens class. So she's doing a part one and a part two. Uh, part two, she'll be bringing on our colleague Andy to discuss some of the, um, what would you describe it? Like foundational elements. Of well, I think primarily the containers to yeah. some of the differences and the winter hardiness of them and needing to store the self-watering things. He's, he works with that all the time and will be invaluable in departing some of that information. Yes, and I see message, we will be recording those classes. So if you can't attend those, we will have them. And I'm excited for that because I know containers can be an investment. So it's good to get information on, on, on those. Yes, it is. And thank right. you for joining us. <laughs> so you can go online or keep an eye out for our emails that are coming out. And David will have our plant clinic on Thursday, which is covering fall lawns. Um, so if you're interested in lawns, now is the season. Uh, our time is flying. But um, Peg, thank you so much as always. And uh, everybody have a great day. Um, Peg, I'm sorry. Do you want to close with anything? Any last notes? No, just to say thank you for watching and hope it was informative. And always let us know through Sally if you have any thoughts or advice or something you'd particularly like to hear about. All righty. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon.